Scientists tell me that approximately, the, like, to break it down, they see 5,000 times better than our eyesight on average. When a tarpon is born, it has rods. When it's a little tiny fry. Those rods are like night vision, like black and white, like a flur, basically. As it starts to develop, he starts developing cones. We have three. Three allows us to see the colors that we know. When he develops, he has five. So he has night vision plus color vision that in the light sample studies, they've proven some things that are below my mind. And you tell the people this and the customer like, really? And then you explain to them, they can tell us apart. They can facially recognize humans and tell them apart. And they can see ultraviolet light penetrating the water. Like a dog whistle we can't hear, we can't see their rainbow of colors. It's so much more diverse than anything we could, our eyes could perceive. I tell people it's like the predator mask. I'm Russell Kleppinger, and this is the Tom Rowland Podcast. Hey, guys. This podcast is brought to you by Waypoint TV. They got so much stuff going on over there. Great hunting and fishing shows, podcasts, great social media accounts. Man, check it out. You can go to waypointtv.com. You can find links to everything they've got there. Instagram is an amazing place to find them. You can find them at waypointtv.fishing, waypointtv.boating, waypointtv.hunting, as well as at Waypoint TV. While you're there, you can follow me, Tom underscore Roland, R-O-W-L-A-N-D. That would be awesome to see you over there. I'm on Instagram a lot. That's my platform I like the most. And it's where I get in touch with most of the guests that we find on this show. So if you, you could, that's one way you can get in touch with me. Another way that you can get in touch with me about this show, th- thoughts about this show, whatever you're you're thinking, or if you have guest suggestions, you can hit me at podcast at saltwaterexperience.com. That's the email address. I will read them and I will do my very best to get back to you. And if you leave a guest suggestion, I'll try to track them down. All right. Today, we've got a mad scientist, crazy man. His name is Russell Kleppinger. And Russell is Fish Russ on Instagram at fish Russ. And I got interested in wanting to talk to him because he put a post up and he said he had caught his 814th tarpon of the year. So I don't know if everybody knows a lot about tarpon. I know enough about tarpon to realize that 814 of them is a whole lot. And if this guy's catching 814 tarpon in a year, not jumping, not seeing he caught 814 tarpon so he's doing something different than other people i want to find out what that is so i'm asking some questions and it leads to a very interesting conversation with russ and i really really enjoyed it i hope you will too stand by because you're going to learn how a tarpon is the superhero of fish all right russ Yes, sir. Super glad to, that that we could make time to do this. Absolutely. You are the tarpon king. <laughs> I don't think so, but I... Why? I don't know. Tell me I, the reason that uh, I initially reached out to you is because I follow most everybody on Instagram and follow you on Instagram, and I'm reading this post, and it says this is the 814th tarpon of the year, I think. Is that the right yes, number? 814. Year. Correct. So in 2000... Uh, 18, Correct. landed 814 tarpon in about seven months. That's pretty incredible. I mean, it's a I don't, very I, good year. Well, that's, that's a, that's a very good year, but there aren't a lot of places that can sustain that. Like, for example, you could, you could catch a lot of fish in Key West Harbor, but the, the, the season doesn't last as long. So you're fishing where mostly government cut. Well, I move with the fish. Okay. So that's why I can catch more because most people live in the location and fish the location. I have a condo right here in North Miami, and I can fish Lauderdale, Miami, Key Biscayne, 
And when the fish leave, I have my little fish shack down in Alamorada. And I go down there and then I follow the migration. I fish Alamorada. Then I work my way down, you know, Long Key, right near Neck of the mm-hmm. Woods, Duck Key. And then I'll jump to the Honda. I, Key West is just too far of a drive for right. charters. But, you know, I'm very flexible when clients, it's tough. It's difficult because like, what time do we meet? Where? I'm like, I just, just show up here and we'll see what the weather does. And right where we're going to meet at, which ramp we're going to fish from. And so how does this, how do, how do you get to the, to the place where you have, you have your place here and you're in Miami and you're moving with the fish all over the place. How does that happen? Probably from a very young age, I'm imagining. No, I mean, just fishing for a living for 26 years, you know, it's just, I've been, I used to rent in the Keys and then I bought that place like four years ago when it was in foreclosure and I found a little conch shack down there, you know, instead of staying with friends or renting a place for the season. But that's a new, it's coming on five years now, new acquisition, having an actual home in the Keys, you know? Right. I'm 46. It's like, it's not cheap. It takes a long time for a fisherman to save that kind of money. Uh, yeah, it to, sure does. To swing two places, you know? Yeah. But you're obviously working a ton. To catch 814 tarpon, you got to be, I how try. many days did you do last year? People ask me, I have no idea. <laughs> because I don't know. People used to ask me, uh, um, can I fish with you on Saturday? I'm like, I don't, what day is that? How many days? I don't even know what day yeah, it is. You text me like, can we be on Sunday? I'm like, um, uh, tomorrow I'll be back. <laughs> Well, no, actually, what you said, <laughs> and, and, and I text you back the You're way like, I text Sunday you. It is Sunday tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, you, you said, well, no, that's not going to work because I'm not coming back till Sunday. And I thought about it for a second, and I thought, this guy fishes a lot. Like, he probably doesn't know what day of the week it is. I'm like, yeah. well, well, tomorrow is Sunday. <laughs> I was like, my bad. <laughs> <laughs> no, that just that just was perfect because that's just. I, I just, my, it used to drive my wife crazy, but I I would never know what day it was. I would go by the date. Like I'm fishing you on the yeah, 18th. I'm right. fishing you on the 19th. It's not a Monday through Friday job. Right. It's not. So how did it start for you to become a professional fisherman? Um, my dad had a boat. I fished with, you know, my family from birth and, uh, where, where did you grow up? Right here. I was born like 10 minutes away from here. Okay. And, uh, grew up here and, Grew up a lot in the Bahamas and in the Keys and, you know, with the with the family just moving around fishing. And my dad was not a very good fisherman, but, you know, he enjoyed it. We had a boat. We had fun. My brother was more hardcore into it, and he kind of got me into it more. But I just always loved it. When I was a kid, I got a job at a restaurant here that my dad's friend owned, and I was cutting fish at the fish market. One of my buddies who worked there, he needed a, a vacation. He was going to go home for Christmas. So they said, hey, can you come in next week and cut fish? And like three years later, I quit when one of my dad's friends had a sport fish boat. I went to the Bahamas traveling as a mate. And then I just started in, you know, mating and traveling. And I was like, I stayed on that job six years. My first sport fish boat. We went from Maine to Venezuela several times and just mostly bill fished, you know, Mm -hmm. and bluefin tunas and yellowfins up north and just traveled. And then from there, I just started running boats and. Spent a lot of years, you know, blue mullein fishing. And then when the economy downturned in 08, the job I had right here locally would just sit at the dock. Go nuts, you know, mm-hmm. cleaning a boat. Right. So I was like, well, and I used to have a charter business as a kid. I was like, I'm going to start it back up so I can do something to keep my, you know, hmm. keep my passion going. Because, you know, I'm sitting here cleaning a boat all day long, cleaning bilges. It's like, I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> I got to go fishing. Yeah. I mean, but that that's where a lot of... um of people kind of end up. And I, it's interesting with the economy like that. I never really thought about that, that people still have the money to own the boat, still have the money to maintain the boat, but the big trips from, from Maine to Venezuela or something like that are not in the cards this yeah, year. Yeah, I mean, and he wanted to travel and do more stuff, but he was busy as a doctor, the last guy that, you know, that, that job I had full time. And it just, uh, I would just started, you know, doing back, you know, fishing at night here because I'd work in the day and then I'd come home and, at lunch, I go grab my shrimp, and then at night, I take off and I go tarpon fishing. Mm-hmm. And um, and my old clients were fishing with me again and stuff like that. And uh, it just kind of progressed, and like that's when social media was just kind of starting back then. And you know, what role did that play? It, did that help you to regain your 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 customers and and 
establish some new customers or a lot of new i mean because it's a whole new marketing avenue right you know my old customers would still call me on my telephone but you know i mean i've never had a website 26 years yeah i've never used a website it's all been word of mouth or referrals or stuff like that yeah well today I, i mean i think that social media trumps websites as far as as um driving business i would imagine I was lucky enough, and I don't know why, but I had one of the first websites of any fishing guide in the Florida Keys. And it's a very strange story because in high school, I was terrified of computer class. I didn't want to go there. The The guy got all mad because I flipped the, the door on the floppy drive too hard and broke it one time. And <laughs> these things were not, I mean, it wasn't like you could go down right. to Best Buy and get another one. Like these things were, you ordered them and it was like in the movie War Games where you took the phone and you put it, you put it on this physical right. I used to have that, an email machine like that in the Bahamas and yeah, hold, the, hold it to the telephone. Exactly, and get an my email machine. That's funny. Um, but for whatever reason, I decided that I wanted to get a computer. And what I, what I wanted to do is I, I, thought I, could, I thought I could keep a journal better like that because I wasn't, I didn't have, I hadn't developed the habit of writing longhand. And I tried many times to write down what I had done. And then I, somehow I thought, well, maybe if I did it like this, then I could somehow search it. And so that was the reason I got my first computer, which was a a little Apple laptop. And then I start, you know, modems are becoming available and I I got online. And what I found online was was this phishing forum and it was called FBN, um, Fishing Broadcast Network. And it was on by the, by AOL. So it was yeah, that's that's that dates it right there that it was an AOL product, but you could get on there and you could talk and people would ask questions and and so I would go on there as a guide and people would ask all these questions. Man, I started booking trips like a bunch of trips, and so then I thought people are like, you need a website. I'm like, what's a website? <laughs> yeah. And this was so, I didn't even know anyone who did it, and um, so I somehow came across somebody maybe on that fishing forum, but this guy was in Canada. And he built my website for me. And I mean, it just, the way, you know, now you can go on, you can build your website. That's crazy. Your phone is everything. I know. I mean, that thing I started with was called pocket mail. And you'd like type out a message and open it up and hold it to the telephone and push it. And and sit there and send emails in the Bahamas on, you know, on a pay phone. Yeah. Yeah. It has really changed. I've seen, I've seen a lot of changes with social media, like used to be that, um, you know, the guy that was working the most and, and, you know, the first to the ramp and the last to leave, that was the guy that people referred business to. And, you know, if you checked your messages too quickly, people knew you weren't fishing and boy, has it changed now? I mean, it's, it's so instantaneous, but you do a really good job on your, on your Instagram. Um, and I, and I'm there all the time. And sometimes it's during the worst weather. Like for instance, just recently the weather dropped I mean, I mean, the temperature dropped a significant drop. It was, it was 62 in Key West. I don't know what it was up here in Miami, but so I'm looking and scrolling through the Instagram and damn, if you don't catch them that night too. So what is it about government? I've never fished there. I really want to fish with you there one day. Um, What is it about this government cut that is such a tarpon factory? So I have a theory. I've been working a lot with scientists and learning things and speaking and, you know, satellite tagging fish and tracking them and learning different things. And, you know, depending on global warming and all that kind of stuff, but in general, Miami has something that's super special. And on the Atlantic coast body of fish, at least, right? Generally, we have the, the support here of infrastructure. So, when you leave Biscayne Bay, there's a lot of grass out there and shrimps, right? They're still alive. So you have food, okay? And when it's cold and it blows and it blows west at, you know, 30 out of the west, and the temperatures are in 40 degree range, and my nose is running, I'm freezing to death, and I'm catching tarpon. It's insane to think about that when it's 40 degrees out and be airing out, you know, 5, 10 tarpon in a trip in a right. four hour because... That's even when it's better fishing. Huh. And that's the craziest part. If you look at the topography of the Keys, 
When you come out of Duck Key, you come out of Key West, how far is it to the edge of the reef? Seven miles, six right. miles, three, maybe even four miles. And what places. happens at the reef? Warm water. Uh-huh. Okay. And as you come north up that reef line and you have the Gulf water, which gets cold and shallow, when you get to like Ocean Reef, it starts to slowly taper. When you hit Fowey is the first time it changes. And at Fowey, it comes into Key Biscayne and that reef line stops, that barrier reef. Now the currents with the east wind can blow in closer, right? Mm-hmm. So from Key Biscayne in Miami area, you get the warmer waters that come in towards the beaches. They're not six miles out. Mm-hmm. Okay, now those fish have a consistent temperature. It can get freezing cold. And all they're going to do, like the red fish in the creeks, they just consolidate. All up. Mm-hmm. So when you're down south in the Keys and people say, oh, the Keys, yay, I have a house there. I'm not fishing there. <laughs> Not the this reason, time of the year. No. And the reason's because it's cold, and that cold water has so much inconsistencies. But here, and of course, you know, the whole Florida is having water troubles, but it's still the fish come here because the water temperature stays consistent temperatures. If it gets retarded cold, look out the window. They're going to move out 100 yards. Mm. That's all they got to do. Really? And so are you taking temperatures? Like, say, say for instance... um, you're getting temperatures that drop in the keys. You're, you're reading water temperatures and are you reading water temperatures on your boat, on your GPS or whatever you're using that are significantly higher than what you're hearing other people are getting? Of course. I mean, but not just like, I mean, that's just what happened in that government cut area. For sure. It is just always warmer for the reasons well, I mean, that you just told me from basically from Key Biscayne, to like Sebastian. Yeah. Right. And now, now Jupiter is where it changes because mm. Jupiter, like when you sail fish south of Jupiter's live baiters, north of its trollers, right? That's where your, your water moves offshore. Right. And that's where the, the drop off gets further. But Jupiter to keep his cane, you got a real tight drop off close to the beach. Right. So you got consistent temperatures, but when a cold front comes, it gets a lot colder in Jupiter. Than it does in Miami. Mm-hmm. So the colder the winter, the more it shoves them down and piles them up here. Wow. But now if you look at Lauderdale, there's canals. There's no seagrass. There's not really any food. You know, I hear the guys up in like Sebastian have a good tarpon fishery and the Fort Pierce guys have them. But as soon as that what temperature drops, yeah. they got to come to me. Yeah. So then you have a situation here where in the most retarded weather to ever tarpon fish in, you have warm water coming in from the Gulf Stream currents because our reef line is so close. And if the bay gets freezing cold, they just push in the inlet or offshore, you know, a couple hundred yards and come back in. It's so close. It's not seven miles to the reef in Key West. You know, if you fish some of the places in the Keys in the spring and the weather gets terrible and it's filthy water, what do they do? They disappear. Mm-hmm. They go to the diver, see them on the reef line all the time. The minute the weather breaks, boom, they're right back in. That's a seven mile run here. It's a couple hundred yards. Yeah. They seem ex- also like even between, even between long key, because my partner, Rich has this theory and he's seen it in action many, many times. But for me in Key West, if the wind clocked to the North, the tarpon, it was death to the yeah. tarpon. West was even worse, but a North wind was really, really bad. Rich at long key bridge says no, at when it clocks North, they eat shrimp all night long and he's gone out there and seen it and that seems like what's going i, I, think I thought that that's what was going on up here does with you. the same thing to a certain temperature yeah and right. then they're like okay i got a bug out and they jump to the reef line but mm-hmm. you know what i can what i understand is that that gulf body of fish sits offshore out there and some filter into the everglades you know mm-hmm. and then when the temperature drop they rush back out and then as the barometer stabilizes they trickle back in and there's a lot of movement mm-hmm. you know the movement here is very minimal yeah. because the temperature is consistent. What happens when it gets cold and blows? Shrimp run. Mm-hmm. The terrible weather causes the food to move. Right. And then you're where the tarpon are. <laughs> so there you go. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, 814 tarpon. Now, when you count those numbers, those are to the boat? Or that's released. Yes. That's released. That's not jump. That's not hook. That's... So you must. That's to the jump. leader. I mean, you, 
That's a very interesting because one of the questions I was going to ask you is what is what does catching 814 tarpon teach you in a year? Um, because obviously you're doing, you've got some stuff dialed in, like, you know, your hook, your leader, everything is dialed in to where you're landing a probably a fairly high percentage of, of fish that you're hooking. It depends on their size Mm. and their, and the, and the angle of the tide. If you're the fish under, like 30 pounds you you're in my in my case my my opinion is that your landing ratio is much lower mm. you know the 30 to 50 is so so once they get 50 70 plus i believe it goes way up mm-hmm. i you have know? my theories on that why do you think it is i think it's like a dog and a cat you put a string on a cat and he's back flipping and going nuts you put a string on a dog and it looks you're like hey what's up when mm-hmm. the rod bends over slow and just the circle hook has time to do his thing everything goes properly when that little bugger closes his lips he's, this ain't right and he's doing backflips in the air before anything even has time to take a set it's just tough mm-hmm. you know the little ones are just they're in the air so fast they don't just turn and make a run that things don't have time to work properly mm-hmm. you know and then there's no weight too i mean you know reeling down on a fish and putting a circle hook in a hundred pound fish is 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 an easier thing to do when that as that fish moves slower like you're talking about but also there's physical weight there right so you're pulling that hook into something that is not not and just it, turning directly to you and it, it's not just a mouth closed and flying through right. the air shaking his head at you you know <laughs> and then it also depends on the angle you know like i learned bill fishing it's so important is the angles with circle hooks and then i took that with tarpon the angles being where you what do you mean by that so, for example, if I'm drifting a bait down, like if I'm anchored, I'm drifting a bait down current and, you know, he, the fish is facing me. He eats it. He's facing me. When he opens his mouth, like worst situation, right? If I'm drifting and, and I'm, say, the, the current's pushing north, for example, or, you know, pushing and I'm drifting a bay, for example, and I got tide heading north and I'm drifting south. So he's in the current stemming it, you know, when he eats my bait, I'm already past him so i'm pulling towards his tail so when he closes his mouth and goes advancing forward from the tension the angle is correct i'm right. pulling towards the corner right. if he's facing me if i'm drifting you know the same way as a current or if i'm anchored and stuff like that it's harder because he's coming at you same with billfish you know when i started with the circle hooks with blue marlin and sailfish and i was trying to figure it out and that's when i learned about putting the rod tip in the water is that you know your rod's up here and you're winding when it comes out everything is flopping coming tight but if you put the rod in the water and wind the belly always creates the correct angle right he could be jumping at you and the boat could be accelerating right but your long as your toe in the belly you're going to get that angle every time hmm. you know what i mean yeah and it's you got to work your angles so when you're when you're instructing your anglers and the tide is such it's either ripping or it's slower or whatever you're thinking about that and you're talking to your, your anglers yeah, about they that? Yeah, they know. I'm saying, okay, we're going to jump them here. We're not going to get as high a ratio because <laughs> the wind and the drift is going to set. They're going to be, you know, coming at us. You know what I mean? Or, and you know, most of the time I don't, I tell the anglers, you know, because people get antsy. I don't let them hold the rods. You want them in the rod holder? Rodney, don't Rodney. set the hook. <laughs> if I learned a trick, if if clients want to hold rods or if I have a, a spread of drifting rods out and then I give them a casting rod, the trick that I've learned is I make them put their rod tip in the water and reel it. So if they cast out a bait or a lure, and I say, you can't hold the rod level. You have to keep it in the water at all times if you want to fish a rod by hand. And they're like, okay, I want a fish rod. And you just they're so focused on keeping the rod tip in the water while they're working the lure. When they get the bite, they press down and reel. Hmm. If it's level, knee jerk reaction, set the hook, set the right. hook every time. And right. then they're like, I'm sorry, I got excited. But if they're focused the whole time on putting the rod in the water, like the first second guide in the water, I said, just keep it in the water and reel. Then you've already broken whatever they're naturally trained to do. And they just wind down and press it in the water and stay tight. And you have your better situation. And that's even with uh, treble hooks, J, J treble hooks. Are you I don't use trebles. Them? You're changing them to single circles? I only use circle hooks and, and J's, you know, like some, some yeah, a few yeah. different J hooks, like from the lure and something else, but very few. I don't use trebles on anything. I've learned better. Now, 
you say you've learned better, is that because you don't want to hurt yourself or you don't want to hurt the fish? All of the above. I don't I don't like them at all. I've and had the worst thing I've ever seen is a double treble. I do not like those. I was at East Cape with my old boss at the dam messing around when it was broken in the old days and the current ripped around mm-hmm. it and we yeah. call a little baby tarpon. And I used, you know, the long shank D hooker yeah. and I had the four X treble hooks on my Rapala. And I grabbed it and I was holding it, gonna de hook a little twenty pounder and he jumped. And a treble hook is a welded fang hook, a fang hook with a welded hook to it. And my de hooker wound up being on the welded hook. And this was a new hook. And when the fish jumped, the welded hook broke off. So he jumped and he had the rear hook in him in his face, like but was the side of his face, like by his socket, and swung the front hook and buried it through my finger and went into my bone and landed in the water, shaking his head. And uh it was very painful. Well, yeah, because that fish is not through shaking his head. No, no, no. Soon. I went into a bear hug with a tarpon <laughs> with treble hooks in my hands. And uh, and then um, that was $9,800 later. They had to do surgery and put me to sleep and put the tendons back together oh. in my fingers because they couldn't just tear it out because it ripped through the tendons and I'm shaking his head. So I lost the mobility of my finger. And I said, okie dokies, no more treble hooks. And I'm I'm with you. I do not like them at all. I will be looking at a barracuda coming in. Uh, Rich likes to fish double treble hooks. I don't like to. I'll, I'll fish a single treble hook or I'll change it to a single J. And uh, the barracuda's coming in. And I'm like, hmm. So somebody said, you afraid of that barracuda? I said, no, I'm not afraid of that barracuda. I'm afraid of that top <laughs> treble hook right there. I need a long D hooker. <laughs> That's right. They can get you badly. Um, have you ever been, you ever had any other injuries from fish? Lots. I mean, that's what we do, you know? I mean, <laughs> Serious ones, like like, like well, you just told had me. had seven hooks taken out of me. Um, I mean, I had a well, blue marlin smash me in the face pretty good and hmm. scarred up a little bit. I've had, and, and you missed the bill? No. No, I did not miss the bill at all. <laughs> what happened? I reached down to let a fish go, and when I reached down for the leader, the fish jumped and was coming in the boat. He just just came straight up and was coming in the boat, and I turned a shoulder to him to, like, knock him back in the water, and he came around with his bill and smashed me in the face and cracked my tooth and, you know. And what part of the world is that? That was right here in the Bahamas. Oh, well, but good thing you can get to a dentist. Yeah, so, you know, there's, uh, there's you know, the, the swivels, the most dangerous thing in bill fishing. In Venezuela, you know, you get the leader and you hold on to it and the fish jumps and stretches out and the swivel comes back and goes, you know, through your shirt and sticks and you through your gloves, sticks your hand, through people's cheeks and smash their teeth. It's when you're light tackle fishing and the whiteies are jumping all over and that little swivel comes back or snap swivels and it's through people's glasses. And I mean, I, you know, you get the swivel tattoos, we call them, yeah. <laughs> stuck real good. You pick one out of your chest. Yeah. But that's, you know, this this game is different. I think leads are the most dangerous thing in the game. If you're fishing something, you know, leaded or a jig head or something like that, when the fish jumps and shakes his head, you know, and then you got the bend in the rod and the stretch of monofilament leader or mono, and it comes back, it's just a rocket. Yeah. What do you do? You fish a lot at night, right? So are you, do you wear glasses or something? I make my fly clients wear clear glasses, like motorcycle glasses. But when you're handling the fish? No. I should, but I don't. Man, I tell you what. I mean, when you're talking about a jig head, I mean, it, so, it sounds like you're not fishing that tackle. For... I do sometimes, depending on the depth of water. But it's um, <laughs> I try to like circle hook jig heads and different things. But even if you fish a, a you know a leader or something with a lead on it, I mean, when the fish jumps and it all stretches out, the the lead is the most dangerous part of the game. Yeah, for sure. You know, I've had one client pretty badly hurt by a lead. And I had one pretty badly hurt by a boga grip. Really? Yeah. What happened with the boga grip? <laughs> I have this this group of English guys, and um, I don't know, it's like 20 years ago, and he caught his first little tarp in like 40-pounder, 30-pounder. And uh, I had him in the water with the boga grip, and his lip was going to get a picture. And I turned to get my, my camera, and he swung the fish in the boat. And I was like, no, 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 no. This is before it was even illegal to do this stuff. And... He swings it in the boat and his buddies got their cameras are taking pictures and he lets go of the boga grip and he holds two hands under the belly of the tarpon like this. And oh. the fish 
swung his head, you know, and, and then when he when he wound up, when he came back around and clocked him with a bug grip, knocked him out. I can see that. And hit him dead forehead and knocked him out. He I mean, he has the giant tumor on his forehead when he woke up. He was asleep. Tarp landed on him, crapped on his face, slime all over him, and he was unconscious. Wow. Well, that's a mistake that he's not going to make again. It was it was <laughs> it was uh it was pretty painful actually i'll try to find a photo it's, it's a classic we were you know because the guy's fishing me for so many years it's not like a first time customer like, oh my god you're okay all his buddies are cracking up laughing and i'm picking <laughs> the tarp and i'm releasing it and reviving them and uh but it's you know i've had eight tarpon jump in my boat and a lot in other people's boats you know big fish can come in and especially if they get under the gunnel if you got rods yeah. down there and that's just a mess there's yeah. no there's no uh there's no it good. never ends well for the fish or for the boat. It, no, it's it's horrible. I, I I can't say that I was wildly opposed to not being able to bring a tarpon into the boat anymore. Because, 100%. you know, uh, some people are, you know, thinking that you can, like a tarpon has a funny way of, all all fish do, I guess, but you get, there's like a tipping point and you've got just the head in the over the gunnel in these little skiffs, you know. And then your friend comes over to check it out too. And now the whole fish slides into the boat and, uh, it can happen accidentally very easily, but, um, man, that that's not anything that you want to have happen. The, you have a different boga grip now. I'm working on one. Yeah. The tarponator. Oh my gosh. That's what a boga. That is a <laughs> giant hematoma <laughs> on this guy's face from the boga grip. Um, that is pretty bad. That, that was a good one. He looks like he's conscious there, but barely. yeah, he was. But uh, he was um, he was laughing in the picture. We'd clean the slime off him and the poop all over him, and he, he was there. It's like, and his buddies were on the ground crying, laughing. Wow! But he Man. was always the guy who always got hurt. He always did stuff wrong. Never listened to anybody. So it's just kind of like par for the course. And so they got what he he got what he deserved, I guess. <sighs> You know, that was, uh, I'd never seen somebody get literally knocked out by a tarpon, but that was the first knockout I've seen. I, I, uh, yeah, I don't think I've ever seen anybody get knocked out. That's, that's he pretty was bad. unconscious, like knees buckled, like prize fighter Tyson hit him, just dropped him. <laughs> <laughs> fish slamming on his face. Does he still fish with you now? He does. He's been fishing me for, they've been here about 20 years. Wow. That's awesome. Yeah. They, it's a group comes from England every year. Yeah. So. Are, you said that you're doing some tagging and and um, working with scientists and stuff. I've done satellite tagging with them and research with them. And, you know, it started for my own selfish, you know, I want, I want to get the emails every day and see what these little buggers are hiding. I let a fish go. And it was cool to see them come out and swim up the beach and then find another school and then come back down. And I could get the emails and know where the pods are traveling because I'm getting updates straight from the scientist of where the tags are pinging. Wow. So it's like having a, you know, beacon on your dog. I can right. be like, oh, here comes another school here. That fish is over here. He's back in a pod, you know? And so what, like, are you seeing, you know, that's obviously one that's that's on his little milk route staying close by. Are you seeing other data where there are lots of data? It's it's mind-blowing. So like, like, well, help me out. Like, you're seeing some that are traveling a long way and some that are staying close. Because I've always had that feeling, like, that's what happens, that there are definitely, you know, when you're in the Keys and you're fishing and all of a sudden there are no tarpon around or very few, and then there's tons, it seems like those fish are coming in from somewhere else, and then they there's a period of time, and then they're gone. But then you have these other resident fish. That all of a sudden, it, the weather slicks off, there's tarpon everywhere. Like, where did those come from? Like, they didn't swim from Africa right. overnight. Right. But what 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 is your tagging information told you about all this what i'm what i'm led to believe is that there's different groups of fish so you got your atlantic body the ones that come down the coast and spend the summers in georgia and the carolinas those are the ones i'm picking on over here and then those come down to the keys right from miami when, when the barometer stabilizes in the spring they push down your caribbean body of fish will come you know st thomas puerto rico you know all that cuba and they come over to spawn and then you've got your Gulf body of fish that, you know, the Boca Grand body of fish that goes way up in the panhandle in the summers and they come down and go into Boca Grand. And some of those fish break and head down in the Everglades in the winter. You've got your like Costa Rica, 
you know, Mexico body of fish that comes up from there and they all kind of get together and have a party and they spawn. Hmm. And, um, and, and it, is any of the tagging work that's being done showing that these different schools, like you say, they all get together and have a party and they spawn are, are these different groups getting together or, or is like this Atlantic body kind of staying together? I, and, I'm not exactly sure on if the bodies mix, but I believe that they do. Yeah. But I know that when they're here, when they show up here, like when you see them daisy chain, right? What they're doing is like a dog smelling each other's butt. That's what a daisy chain is. When they come in and start circling, that's the males smelling the female's hydration level. So it's interesting because the female, when she goes to spawn, you know, it's not like what kind of car you got or whatever. It's about the male being exactly ready to sperminate the eggs when her eggs are ready. Mm -hmm. So that's how she picks her partner. So when you see those, you know, the daisy chainings, those are them smelling each other. And when you, when you, you know, you can mark mating pairs, you can catch them and you'll see when you catch the female, the male will be right there with her like dolphin, mm -hmm. you know, you catch a mahi, you mm -hmm. see them and you know that it's already, they've already paired. You know what I'm saying? And they're they're making the route together because they've already found a match. Mm. And fish don't all spawn the exact same day on the same moon. Different groups will head off at different times depending on when they're ready. Mm -hmm. And they push, you know, I mean, you live in the Keys. You know what, what's going on. They, they push offshore and it's a huge group of thousands of fish. But there could be one on the new moon. There could be another group on the on the next full moon, right. you know. They, they they go in different intervals and the female she can drop between four million and eight million eggs and she can drop that twice in in a season you now twice in a month she can go out and spawn again if she does not spawn out but what the tags show that's so impressive is when the guys are dolphin fishing seeing those giant schools of tarpon out there is that the tarpons dive to about 200 feet deep and as they're diving they turn belly to belly and every 33 feet in atmosphere, so the pressure starts increasing. And as they're, you know, sending, you know, swimming down together, stomach to stomach, the pressure is squeezing the eggs and sperm out of the two, and then they're mixing, and they get fertilized. Hmm. Then our southeast trade winds blow those eggs back towards the shore. Each egg is like a little clear balloon with a drop of oil in it. And, you know, we all have our theories. I'm not a scientist. But if I had to say we're at a catastrophic tipping point right now is my theory and these fish they have to gorge themselves to spawn that little clear drop of oil makes the egg float that's the fat she has to gorge herself to put the fat content in her body so her eggs don't sink out there mm -hmm. right and one thing about fishing at night is you learn the amount of food available by hearing the fish popping right and 20 years ago, they were frothing. 10 years ago, they were popping. Now, it's so few the intervals at night of shrimps and crab passing out the channels that there's not enough food is what I think by spending my time on the water for these fish to build their fat content up. Hmm. You know, look at the keys. We sit there. Every bridge pylon's got a guide on it or, a, you know, a guy in his boat, right? Mm -hmm. We're beating on these poor things. And they're trying to just hang out and eat and get ready to spawn. So we're not helping the situation. I understand that. We're just trying to make a living and catch some fish and let them go as humanely as possible. But what I see is that this fishery is with, with the grass and the keys, all that red slimy weed that's coming out and the grass flats. There's no, at night, the shrimp aren't flowing. The crabs aren't flowing. The fish aren't up popping. I'm having to fish baits with the split shot on them instead of a cork. Hmm. I have to fish deeper to get my bites because they're not up in the water column, right? So that's not a good sign. And my buddy, who's what I consider to be the best of the best on the West Coast, he's telling me that he's catching fish in October, that when he's getting into the boat, they're sperming and egging out next to the boat. Really? Because when Boca Grande this year had the red tides, the sharks were really bad in the past is what I'm told. The fish could not stay there because of the shark problem. They went off short of spawn, but the red tide stopped. And they kept playing ping pong. They tried to come in. The sharks would eat them. They tried to go out. The red tide stopped them. So they were sitting up rivers. Thousands of fish were sitting inland. 
where they shouldn't be. And he was wearing them out, this giant groups of fish. And it was awesome fishing, but everything was wrong place, wrong time and backwards. But every fish he's catching is still full of eggs and sperm that should have spawned out. Wow. And I think that, and you know, from what I know and what he's telling me, what I'm seeing is we missed a breeding cycle on the Boca Grand, that, that group of fish last year in 18. So when do you, do you, um, you've made this relationship with these scientists. Have you expressed this theory to them? Oh yeah. Yeah. They're well aware of it. And then that, what is their response from a scientific point of view? Is, is that possible? Is that, I mean, is that surprising to them at all? Or are they in, in agreement with this? They're scientists, not fishermen. So they think totally differently. You know, they have to cut fish up and, and gut them to find the eggs in them to believe it. You know, they have to come about their theories with different processes than we do as fishermen on the water. Yeah. Know? I mean, we, we were actually talking about this in this last thing that I did with captains for clean water and there were scientists there and I was asking about, you know, our, our fishing guides beneficial for collecting this data. And one of the things that came out was that for the scientific method, there are certain ways that you have to collect data so that it is a scientific process right. and that, that this is going to stand in the, in the, you know, in the textbooks or whatever, that right. this is, uh, you know, true science. And so there can't be any, you know, I saw this, they have to document it some, right. somehow. So I just wonder, they, they probably do believe it right away, but they still have to do their Work. They have to come up with their conclusion, right. you know, scientifically and working with them, you know, it's a different mentality. I know how I like to handle a fish. Scientists are terrible. Well, I mean, I've never seen there's fish not a handle scientist that out badly there. ever as a scientist handling fish. You know, when they put that tag in it, we're not talking like, you know, a sailfish with a little pin. We're talking literally like a 10 inch stainless harpoon that they're putting in the tarp and trying not to hit his backbone. So the tag doesn't come out that when they tag fish at a Honda, they had a hundred percent shark rate. Every fish that got tagged there got eaten. Now are the sharks bad down there? Yes, they can be. But I think that when you wear a fish down that much yeah, and you drag them and lip gaff them and stretch them and tail rope them and measure them and tag them and take samples and then let them go. Listen, man, you can hook them at Bahia Honda for 30 seconds and the big right. hammerhead eats them. So a uh, lip right. gaff and, and dragging but them I, around the process it's is a hundred percent. It's very invasive, you know, and yeah. in Miami, I think that the tagging bodes better because there's a lot less sharks right. in certain places. Now, last year we had a shark population that became a problem and, um, down on, on around, around the cut. And, um, you know, the fish left and I found them other places and I won't fish them and I won't fish them in an area. The sharks are bad. Right. And, you know, probably can't say it on the radio, but as you, as you probably see at the Honda and other bridges and the keys, what locals do to deter sharks eating your fish is, uh, you know, the one thing sharks are terrified of is the smell of a dead shark. Mm -hmm. And it's not politically correct, but it may save thousands of tarpons lives. Right. And you see it happen and it's, it, it's functional. Mm -hmm. You mean like what you're saying is killing them. And I mean, I've seen the sharks hung from bridges. Tied to pilings. Tied to pilings. Driver guys get mad after watching hundreds of tarpons destroyed and the fish leaving. And somebody, you come out the next day and you smell something, you look around and there's a tail of a lemon shark or something from a flat, you know, sitting there and miraculously all the tarpon come back and all the sharks leave. Yeah. That's an old trick from the, from the commercial fishermen that they used to, yeah. you know, when the sharks were so bad, they couldn't yell a tail or whatever. And they would just catch one, chop it up into pieces. And then the, my, my friend, that's a commercial fisherman, lifelong commercial fisherman would say that the sharks would actually eat the pieces of the other shark. And then it, he, his feeling was that it hurt their belly and then they all got sick and they left. But I mean, I don't know. I mean, that's one thing when I watch the stuff about like pilots, the shark repellent that they made in the mm -hmm. old days mm -hmm. was boiling sharks. The smell of a boiled shark was like the shark repellent. Like that was like the one smell they couldn't stand. Mm -hmm. So we tried that. Um, we had a little show kind of, it never made it off the ground, but it was 
it was called Shark Man, and we were going to um, do all these different things with sharks. And one of the things that we were going to do with sharks was to test shark repellent for for people. And so you have a very experienced diver that goes down, gets all these bull sharks are coming around and open this can. What happens? Like, because the scientists aren't going down there and doing that. So it's like you put somebody that has a lot of experience that's around sharks all the time, go down and open this can of shark repellent. Does it deter the shark or does it not deter the shark? And uh, so we were testing all of these different things. And it was pretty interesting. Um, I was actually quite nervous about it because when you open a can of shark repellent on a bunch of sharks that you're pretty sure aren't going to bite you or attack you or whatever, and now you're doing something that you've never done before. Don't know the reaction. Exactly. It could be catastrophic. It could rip your arm off. You know, a shark that would have no problem with you there and they're feeding, you know, they're feeding the sharks and doing all this stuff. And then you open up this weird thing. What does that do? It actually barely did anything, but that's how they uh, made it is they would uh, take these small sharks. They put them in a 55 gallon drum, put the top on it, leave it out in the sun for a while. And let me tell you something, man, the smell of that. Oh, something I never forget. Oh, never will I forget it. And this was this person's job was to go open these barrels and see if they were ready and when they were ready you they would be up. completely putrefied <laughs> and liquefied and can you imagine you know august in in the keys opening this thing up you didn't have to open it to know it was ready the flies told dude, you dude i mean you smell that thing from 100 yards away it was the worst smelling thing ever and then they would take that liquid liquefied putrefied shark and they would somehow pour it out and then they would work with that and refine this down into something that they could bottle and into this aerosol type thing where when you open it it shoots out and oh it was horrible so i don't think that product ever got off the market it may have been effective but i don't know how they there were was ever one gonna called find shark somebody. shield did you well, ever see that one yeah well we want our underwater diver uses it all the time it shocks him more than it shocks it anything almost kills me how <laughs> I, I borrowed one because I was in San Salvador. Yeah. And we're like by the hump. We're going to dive green Green Island, like on the North Point. And uh, I said, man, it's really sharky here in the edge right there. Like and my, my, the guy in the arena had one. And he said, here, try it. He's like, just get in the water and turn it on. And I was like, okay. And uh, I swam down, you know, and I looked under a ledge for some lobsters. And when I got inverted, the tether you know, continue to fall and I'm underneath there, like on 35, 40 feet of water, like as far as I can go. And I'm digging around trying to get lobster out and the tether hits me in the chest and lights me up and electrocutes me and your muscles, you know, you flinch and your air goes away. You go, <laughs> Now you have no air and you're sitting on the bottom and you're electrocuting yourself. And the stupid thing that I'm trying to keep the sharks away is all my air is gone. And I go shooting for the top. And I'm like, I'm going to black out before I make it there. And my buddy was watching. Of course, they were dying laughing. But I think if, you know, they're watching me and they, they're laughing, but if I would have, you know, blacked out, they probably would have got me back up in time. But let's uh, hope. But it, that's uh, what I said immediately was, was, yeah, our diver uses one of those and it shocks him more than it shocks anything else. But the thing, all you know, you're going and, and the waves are going like this. And so this, this tether is floating yeah. underneath you and between your legs. And sometimes as the, as the, you know, the waves are going like this, the tether, you know, you uh-huh. get out of, out of uh, sync with, not everything's going up and down at the same time. So this tether comes up and gah, that <laughs> I'm well aware of it. <laughs> so yeah. I have no, uh, no doubt that if that thing actually touched a shark, a shark wouldn't like it, right. but it's supposed to be putting off an electrical field right. that the shark doesn't like either. And that, that was one of the things also that we wanted to test. Did that thing work? And uh, I mean, I don't know. It was kind of like one of my friends before, uh, they put the, the shock collar on their dog that they love so much. They wanted to make sure that it wasn't too bad. So they put it on themselves and ran through the, I, I've done ran that. through the fence. Yeah, it works. <laughs> you don't want to do it again. <laughs> you can set, you know, the, the, the number like one through a hundred, you know, and uh-huh. you can put it yourself to see what it's really like before you want to test it. on Yeah. The animal, but... but it's hard to know, uh, whether it's on one or a hundred and, uh, usually well, mine has like a remote with a digital readout. Oh, it does? Because yeah, mine you only could beeps. Set it. No, no, this one you could set, you know what I mean? Just hold it yourself and press the shock, you know, and feel it. Yeah. But your skin is so soft versus their hair and thicker, you know. Right. 
a little harder penetration. I have a dog that needs needs um has always needed that on the highest possible setting <laughs> because I, I call it slow uh, learner. Huh? You have like well just just you know lab it's a lab and uh, he's very driven dog very alpha and uh, it takes a lot to get his attention. I understand. And so I always set it on cattle. Like on the cattle setting, <laughs> because you have like one to a hundred, and then you have bull or cattle. Like you really need to get something's attention. T Rex over here, yes, T Rex. And uh, man, even even when it does get him, he's kind of like determined. I think I could make it through if I just had a little more speed. <laughs> 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 but, but that shark shield, I'll tell you what, that's, that's, um, that is a, that is a product that I'm sure works, but boy, you have to be careful. I've never heard of anyone getting in trouble like that, but at 40 feet, I've, I, I you really know, free diving. I mean, the I thing, know. It, it's, it's, it, I'd, I'd rather deal with a shark next time than try to play with that thing. Yeah. Yeah. The sharks, man, the sharks have been. I think that they're, they're changing the fish's behavior and migrations. There's places that I fish here in Miami that there's never been tarpon before, hmm. in my opinion. Like, I've never found them there, and all of a sudden, I'm finding them there. And, like, I was joking. I said, the Keys is full of robots, you know, nine to fivers. They're banker hour fishermen, and they just they just go do the same thing. They don't explore. They don't they don't get outside of their box of comfort very often. Most guides. Yeah. They're definitely guys. I'm saying as the a, milk as route. A, yeah. Milk routers, you know, they, they're definitely those, but then there are also, well, of course there's all levels. There's, I mean, I'm yeah. just saying as a general right. basis, you know, and, and from a financial point of view, I mean, I get it. Like they make way more money because mm-hmm. they can go run their morning trip, their afternoon trip, maybe a sunset yes. trip and they go to bed. And me, I'm the retard who's out there, you know, starting a trip at three in the morning to catch the tide and we're crushing them. And, and then I'm beat up and exhausted, you know, and I fish like another morning or whatever I can fish and sleep in my truck at the ramp and then, you know, try to make it home alive. And, you know, it's not the best business plan. Those guys, they make way more money when they run their scheduled trips. It's easier to tell the customer, you'll be here at noon at this spot, you know. And, mm-hmm. Well, that's going to be, that's they're going to run a, a, a an eight to noon. Right. They're going to run a one to uh, five so, yeah. and then they're going to run, you know, a sunset trip and they're going to do that every single day, no matter what the tide is. And that, right. you know, that's, that's fine. I always, I, I, I never did the half days. I just didn't like half day. I mean, of course I'd take a half day if that was all that was there, but I would encourage full days all the time. And one of the things that I was, it was probably a very poor business decision. But we're fishermen. We're was, bad businessmen to yeah. start with. Well, some some are good. Some are good businessmen. But like you're saying, if if you're going to say, okay, well, I'm going to get this engine and it only burns a little bit of gas, and I'm only going to go no further than that right. island out there, and I won't catch plenty of fish, and and it's going to be great. And no matter what tide, that's just my little milk crowd. Right. And I'm going to do that. And I'm going to burn two gallons of gas, and right. I'm going to make a lot of money. And they will. Um, but then there are those other guys that say. I'm going wherever the fish are, and like you're saying, whatever time of day that is, whatever city, whatever zip code, right. whatever time. And I never, I never was concerned about fuel. I just always thought, you know what? There'll be the days that I only burn two gallons, and there'll be the days where I burn the entire tank. And what you know, it'll all, it'll all. I'm like a bait aholic. I waste so much money on bait. Yeah. Well, when you're buying shrimp the size of the ones I see uh, on your Instagram Shrimps are page. cheap. They're easy. So what? tell me about catching 814 tarpon. What kind of, what are you not really, what's the rig in, in government cut? It, it depends on the depth of fish are at. You know, sometimes it's a jig head, but generally I try to use a circle hook, you know, with a, a let up the leader. You know what I mean? But But what's the bait? In the winter, all I use is shrimp. Only shrimp. That's it. And you don't have much problem with jacks and bycatch and Sometimes other things? Sometimes you catch some muttons or little groupers yeah. or, you know, a mangrove or a jack or something. But, hey, Roger Bennett, starter uh-huh. fishing. Yeah. Well, I like that. But you some know. places, you know, the blue runners just, if you put a shrimp out there, you, the there's keys, no possible The topography way. is different. There's so much other stuff to eat a shrimp. Yeah. You know? And basically, the way, the way, the way I run my 
my situation is that once they get big enough to put on a circle hook, you know, I start using shrimps. Mm. And, um, you know, so, you know, starting like January 1st, just like for the year, you know, you're shrimp fishing January and February. And then Marchish, you know, they're getting a little smaller, you know, so you yeah. start incorporating some crabs in because they cost more money. You don't want to be using them just yet. And then, you know, so you're kind of. Do you think the crabs are better bait? If they were the same price, would you just go with crabs? No, I, I really don't. I mean, I think yeah. they eat a shrimp really well, but so do all the trash fish. Yeah, so right, if right, they're right. too small and right. the trash fish is bad, they'll eat How that. big is crab do you like? Um, For the I, Miami fish. I, I, always all the same. I don't. I'm very weird. And I don't, you know, like I see these guys that fish these massive crabs. I've never caught a tarpon on one. I and swear, I've never caught I one. I call them slack tide baits. When the, when the tide goes slack, if I'm fishing the Keys or Bridges or something, or if I got a drift going and it's slow tide, then I want that big flapper swimmer out there. And, you know, then I'll fish to a bigger size crab, like like my buddy calls them uh, cigarette packs. Mm-hmm. You know, I'll fish one that's, you know, the size of a cigarette pack mm-hmm. during that slack tide. But if the tide's moving, that's a lot of drag, you know? And right. The, they're just harder to eat. And I think they they select they they cut you out of the game on other size fish. You're just gonna have to be a beast to eat that thing. Those mediums, smaller fish are not gonna you know, you're not gonna get a bite. So I try to use smaller size crabs, mm-hmm. you know. I've uh, that's been my experience. Like uh the bigger the crab, the fewer the bites, and I get bored with it and tired of it and I just don't I, I, I just for a long time I didn't have very much confidence in crabs and tarpon. And then when I started using the smaller permit size crabs or smaller then it was the whole it was everything changed and then if you do catch a snapper on one of those it's going to be a it's going to be a one that you're pl- yeah, pretty happy to get or a hog or something right. yeah but um so so you fish the shrimp for a little while then the crabs and then how long does that last i i generally january february and the march is shrimps and march starts shrimps and crabs april shrimps and crabs and then i'll also pilchards you know in april mm-hmm. And then, you know, the mullet start mixing in in the game. And then, you know, April's like just like a, all kinds of different bait. Ballyhoos, pilchards, mullets, cigar minnows. And so with your schedule, are you able to to catch all that bait yourself? Or do you have to, I mean, you're running a lot of trips and you're running them at all times of the day. So how do you collect your bait like that? Is some of that you're buying? All the shrimps I it? buy you know, the mullets I generally catch up here down in the Keys, we buy them. Mm. It, you know, if I can't catch them readily, then I'll just buy a mullet, but it's expensive. Yeah. And that's why I charge a little extra in the Keys for the cost of bait. And like I said, I'm a bait, baitaholic. And, you know, the mentality I, I take to tarpon fishing is like the opposite of what everybody else does. You now, people like that know me, they just laugh and they're like, you're <laughs> stupid. Well, let's hear it. I mean, you go kite fishing, right? Mm-hmm. They got out two kites. They got six baits out, three in each kite. Then they got a flat, a mid, a deep rod, right? Maybe a king rod with some wire down there. Mm-hmm. And they hook up. They don't reel stuff in. They start casting baits at the one they got on. You know, I I usually have 16 rods in my boat when I'm tarpon fishing. You know, a lot of the time when I hook up, depending on the situation, I've heard a bridge and piling, stuff like that, but I don't reel my other lines in. I generally start putting more lines in the water because I think there's fish around now. Mm-hmm. And that usually yields, yields more multiple hookups, you know? Well, judging by your Instagram, I've seen plenty of triples. Yeah, and I don't, I hook up, I start throwing more rods in. I'll have five, eight rods in. I'm making a giant mess. And sometimes it's just a cutter at the end of it because it just becomes disaster. But I ruin lots of tackle. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when I hook up, I just start putting more baits out. I don't. I don't, you know, I don't do what the opposite guy does and brings two rods or four rods out there and puts one or two in the water. And- well, it makes tons of sense because that, you know, it, you're, you're, you have a tremendous offshore background that a lot of people don't, you know, that come, some people come into this world through the fly fishing right. trout world. And then they're, they're coming into this world and, oh, tarp and eat mullet too. And I'm going to do some of that and I want to learn about it. And then we've hooked one. Now I don't want to lose him, so let's reel everything else right. in. But from the offshore world, it starts with catching bait, 
You don't even put a rod in the water until you build this up. And now you've got the yellowtail in a giant ball behind you. You keep feeding, keep feeding, keep feeding, keep chumming. Right. Now it's time to put a line in the water. And then when you hook one, you leave them in the water for a second because they throw up everything they just ate. Or mahis. I mean, right, school same and you're, thing. You're, you're, you hook one, you start chumming the rest of them. Exactly. And, and you hook one, yeah. and that's the that's been the common thing is like leave that guy in the water right. and they'll, they'll stay around. And for that, I don't see any reason why that wouldn't work for tarpon because you've obviously come across some sort of a group of fish or a single fish or whatever. And when fish bite and fight, it brings other fish in. For sure, and, I I think so, and you know I I get a lot of lot of multiple hookups, and I fish again. I mean, I fly kites for tarpon. I use planer boards for tarpon. Now, when you're I flying use, kites for tarpon and and planer boards, are you doing that in government cut? Depends on where I'm at. I do it in the Keys. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, it can be incredibly effective down there, um, and I've done that too in channels and stuff where you. You fly a kite, and the kite is the ultimate presentation. It, I, do, I don't, I love it, but you know, it adds more complications to the to the fishing. But the hookup ratio doesn't seem to be quite as good, you know, because you got. You think that, that goes back to the angle that you're talking about? No, I think the angle's okay. I think it's that if the clip that doesn't pull down and everything comes tight, if it opens and he feels any tension and comes up jumping too fast when it's trying to come tight, like. You can't fly helium like you would sail fishing and, and kite fish. You need to have a good sustainable wind that the kite can get pulled down with tension, you know, to where you can maintain that no drop back, no slack. You know, it can't paw, fall out and wind the slack tight, you know what I mean? Because he's going to be up shaking his head. Right. And I've been trying these planer boards out, and they're problematic with weeds. But like those, now, with the planer boards, the way that I've used planer boards – and and not very much in salt water. It's more in fresh water, but the boat is moving. But I would imagine that you can use planer boards with the tide where you're stopped and anchored, and then you can use the tide to push it out there. Is that what yeah, you're doing? You can, or you, you can anchor, the boat? Or you control a motor, you can drift. Mm-hmm. I mean, you see them striper guys and the yeah, walleye no, guys. That's I what mean, I've done with them. I mean, sometimes these walleye guys or uh, striper guys, they're fishing 10 rods off a planer board. They've got 20 rods you're trolling. Mm-hmm. And I was like, really? Yeah. You know, the problem is if it's weedy, you know, yeah. but you can set a planer out there and instead of having your eight foot beam boat or nine foot beam boat with the wind blowing and two baits, you can have mullets out, you know, in the current, you know, 50, 75 feet on each side. Right. And then you can have another planer here and fish them in line, or you right. can have them on a kite reel and set them out there with clips and have drop backs, you know, you just got to keep the line out of the water for the belly of the weed. And, uh. It's a great idea. Now you can set spreads and you can set one mid water. You can put a kite up. You can just get as stupid as you want with it. But I got hooks in the water, you know, right. lots of hooks. Yeah. Well, it's the same thing with the, with, you know, the offshore kite situation is that the, you know, the reason that that's effective is because you're now covering hundreds of yards of water as this 36 foot boat or whatever. Right. Hundreds of yards on the right side, Your hundreds foot, of yards. 10 of foot the, beam, eight foot, nine foot beam. Right. Is now. Massive. Yeah, and 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 even then, even with hundreds of yards, you're still talking about the ocean, and you're still talking about you know these fish may be swimming in deeper water or shallower water today, but you just you just increased your chance of coming across these fish much much more. So I like that with the planer boards and the tarpon. I might try that at um at one of the bridges because that's it's just about the weed. Yeah, you know, and I put glow sticks on the planer boards at night. Huh. And try different things. I put glow sticks in my bobbers. And it's funny because the one guy down there, I saw a few people, they've been watching a lot, you know, and now they're starting to, I see glow sticks flying by me at night and I'm <laughs> laughing and I'm like, they're catching on. <laughs> but they, do they know that they're on a planer board or they're just throwing glow sticks out there? I mean, it just it, on, on a cork or, you know, sometimes I tape them to a cork or I put them on a planer board or I do, I put them on my leaders. I yeah. try all kinds of just. I'm like nuts. I just do all kinds of stupid stuff to try to see what works. So what do you think of all of the innovations that you've tried and, and come up with, you know, probably laying in bed, looking at the ceiling, thinking, you know what? I think that would work. What do you think has been the most effective for you and Tarpon? Just the concept of like 
putting out as many rods as humanly possible. That's like the best concept instead of the one rod show or, you know, the standard dude throws out two live mullet and a dead mullet on the bottom or a dead mullet and, you know, two dead and one live or whatever. I mean, I try to, you know, be a porcupine of just (laughs) stuff going on, you know? And, uh, I think that when you understand tarpon, you respect them more. And the more you can learn about, like, you know, if you're a hunter, like your prey, Mm -hmm. the more I learned from the scientists, the more I was like, wow, I had no idea how amazing these fish really are. I was just, I loved them. But once you really understand tarpon, then you're like much more involved and in love with them when you respect them. Like, like the way I try to, and I try to treat them, a certain way I I try not let people touch them I mean how old do you think tarpon get well that's a very good question I think they get very old and when I say very old I think you could have a 60 year old fish older older 100 year old fish the oldest you know scientific odalis that they odalis is the ear bone as you know Mm -hmm. yeah and they cut them out and they got rings on them and the oldest otolith that they've studied is 83 years old. 83. And how big was that fish? Do you know? I don't know the weight of it. But I know that you're a 30-pound tarpon. How old is he? Well, I, I don't know this. I would love to know all these things. But my my personal theory is that they're going to grow from about 6 inches to about 5 pounds rather quickly. And then they're going to slow down. But I don't know. Well, tell me what you know. Those fish are almost 10 years old. 10 years old for a little 30 pounder. Yeah. Wow. 30, 40 pound fish. Those are, they're, they're nine years old, you know, depending on their food source. They had fish that they put microchips in. They like did shocking and like back bays, the Everglades and stuff and places. And, and they went back a year later and other, you know, other times and they'd shock these bays and they, you know, they'd scan the fish and, and it was actually smaller. Smaller. If it wasn't enough food, it, it shrunk. It didn't grow. Wow. Um, the thing that I've learned about tarpon that makes me like so crazy with them is that is as, as a world of fish, it's Superman. There's no other fish in the world like it, period. Like not even close. Like Superman is like way faster, way better, sees better than us. That's a tarpon. They see how, how well do you think they see? Like I'm saying it, but you know, of course they see well, but yeah, well, I think, I think because of their, um, they're a very nocturnally oriented fish. I would say that they have incredible eyesight. What is their scientific name? Megalops atlanticus. Giant what? eye. Exactly. Right? Mega, mega opticus. The mega opticus atlanticus. The biggest eye of the Atlantic. Scientists tell me that approximately, they like to break it down, they see 5,000 times better than our eyesight on average. Wow. When a tarpon is born, it has rods when it's a little tiny fry. Those rods are like night vision, like black and white, like a flur, basically. As it starts to develop, he starts developing cones. We have three. Three allows us to see the colors that we know. When he develops, he has five. So he has night vision plus color vision that in the light sample studies, they've proven some things that blow my mind and they tell people this and the customer like really and then you explain to them they can tell us apart they can facially recognize humans and tell them apart and they can see ultraviolet light penetrating the water like a dog whistle we can't hear Mm -hmm. we can't see their rainbow of colors it's so much more diverse than anything we could our eyes could perceive i tell people it's like the predator mask you know, he could be in night vision. He can go to thermal imaging. He can go to color. And the time it takes them to blink, hmm. they can switch. And what the light sample show, studies show, they had him in tanks and controlled rooms, and they'd pull him out and cut their eyes out and see what they're doing in the dark. You know, the scientists are scientists. Hmm. And they took small fish, and they put them in these tanks and controlled the light in the room. At night, the rods are at the front of the the lens, and the cones are in the back. And they were in night vision mode. And then at sunrise, sunset, like kind of different ambient lighting, they can be both at the front of the lens overlapping. So they can use like night vision with color. Wow. And whichever's better. 
And then when the sun's up, the rods will recede to the back of the eye and the cones are at the front. And that happens like in the time it takes to blink, their eyes can adjust. So they have the most advanced eyesight in the world. There is, according to the scientists, there's nothing in the world that swims that sees better than a tarpon, period. Not one fish. So you're dealing with a fish that has incredible eyesight. They did a few studies. One was that when they were doing an odalis study, they put a few tarpon in a, like a big above ground pool. My buddy's the one that caught them and gave them to them. They hand fed them like pets, like Robbie said. It's like an charter dock pets, right? Now there was three of them in there. They injected them with a chemical, put them in one year to the date. Boom. They're going to bring them out, kill them, cut out their odaluses and see where the stains at, see how much it grew. Scientist goes over, puts a hook in the water with a piece of bait, fish jumps, pulls a hook. They can't catch them. They lost their confidence. Hand fed pets. Spend the whole day, they couldn't catch them. Next day, they couldn't catch them. But now their study is not going to be accurate because it's not 365 days, right? So they call my buddy back. I'm like, hey, like, what are we doing wrong? We can't catch these things. He shows up. He's got fluorocarbon. He's got live bait. These fish are sketched out. They throw in bait in the morning. It's gone. But, you know, it lays on the bottom of the pool, but they wouldn't eat it. They tried to, to drag a net across. They jumped over it. They had to drain it down and shoot them with spear guns to cut their eyes out. And it was, I mean, their odalis is out. And it was like three days later. So it wasn't exactly, you know, to date to see the stains on the, uh, you know, on the odalis from the injection. But that quickly, they lost the confidence of the fish. And this is why I'll tell you a really crazy story. At the labs over in, by Tampa, they did behavioral studies, the FWC scientists. And they had four tanks. And those four tanks had one scientist that went there, you know, guy in a white lab coat feeds a fish. And after three months of behavioral conditioning, they were pets. You could hand feed them just easy as pie. They knew you, right? And that tank never got introduced to another person. But after three months, when they'd become behavioral socialized to the point that they were total pets, then they introduced two scientists to the tank. White lab coats. And each day they did the same, you know, scientists. So they'd walk up and they'd walk in a circle and feed them and, you know, and, you know play with them and hand feed them. When they introduced two scientists to the tank, they walked up and then they separated and went to opposite ends and they walked around both with buckets of food, guys in white lab coats. And all four tanks, every tarp in the tank stared at the guy who fed them, turned their tail to the new guy. Wow. They didn't pay attention to the new guy. They all knew who daddy was. So they proved they could facially recognize the people and tell us apart and know who was the guy feeding them and who was the new guy. Don't pay attention to him. Wow. So that proves the level of eyesight that they have. If you look at them, you know, on a timetable before the dinosaurs walked the earth in the Jurassic period, the Devonian era was here. They've been dated back to the Devonian era. So before a dinosaur was here, there was tarpons here. So they've got hundreds of millions of years of evolution. It's the only saltwater fish in the world that can breathe air. It's gills have valves. If he jumps and rips a gill plate out and starts bleeding to death, he can turn a valve and shut it off. If you cut your juggler, you bleed to death. Mm-hmm. He can turn a valve off and stop that gill from bleeding. He's got the best eyesight in the entire world. After that, he's dumb. He wants to eat and not get eaten and stay warm. But he has a few senses that makes him super special. Mm-hmm. And he gets to be at least 83 years old. They they also have a good sense of smell. I mean, if you're chumming for sharks, sometimes yeah. they. I mean, I don't know any right studies on smell, but I know that I've chummed them, and they come yeah, to chum. They come but, right in there, right? But I'm saying I, I I don't know any data on that, but I know that it works real good. Yeah, it works great in Key West Harbor. Oh yeah, <laughs> I can tell you that there's a lot of people making a living by putting stuff in the water. Well, I think part of that's behavioral conditioning too, yeah. to the location. Absolutely. Absolutely, that's fascinating. You know, I tell people when they want that picture next to the boat. You know, and I'm like, how old are you? And they're like, oh, 30, 40. I'm like, how old's your dad? And they're like, oh, he's 60. I said, well, here's your dad laying there. You want to kill him for a picture? Right. That that fish that's that big, that buck 50, that 200 pounder, it's a really old fish. So, and once once they put that mental image in their head that that's their dad on the end of the rod, then they want to be delicate with it. You know, they change their whole game of like, drag him in the boat, get a picture, or hurt him. You know, I don't even let him touch him, hold the leader. Now I've got the lip device I've been working on. And 
trying to come up with better methods to release the fish without hurting them. I mean, I'm terrible. Like I know like my carbon footprint on tarpon is, you know, I'm one of the worst offenders because I'm out there torturing these poor things because I catch the most, joke the most, jump the most. You know, I herd them out of spots. I know when I start catching them and they get mad at me and they leave, you know, I know my, my pressure I put on them and I feel guilty about that. So I try to keep, keep them as healthy as possible at the same time. Mm -hmm. What about, what about the idea that through your experience, uh, you can take what you have learned and help to preserve hundreds of thousands of tarpon. That's what I try to do with every customer and every, you know, like I'm building this new lipping device. It's, you know, similar to a giant boga, but I can't tell me times if, if you, you know, I mean, the customer goes next to the boat and he grabs the leader and he reaches out and touches the face of the fish. The second you touch him, he freaks out. Mm hmm. And a lot of the time he freaks out, starts shaking his head and smashes it in the boat, gives himself right. brain damage. He's dead. He's shark food. So in my mind, I'm like, well, I have a responsibility to try to come up with a better method, right? Lip gaffs penetrate the membrane at the bottom. Okay, fine. But what I think is the worst part about the lip gaff, if it was so small that it literally went around the bone and clipped in, it wouldn't be so bad. But every lip gaff is a six or eight inch gaff or better. And it goes in the mouth every time they shove it straight in. So now it goes in eight inches and then rotates down and then comes in here and then rips all the way up to here. So we're not talking about a pinhole at the chin. We're talking about an eight inch, you know, incision mm -hmm. and laceration all the way up the entire bottom of the chin, which ruins their vacuum feeding abilities. Mm -hmm. And then the fish can still shake his head and smash in a boat. Right. Yeah, I don't like the uh, the lip gaff very so, much. I don't see that many people using them anymore. Well, 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 now what do they do? You take a glove and they put it on and the fish goes to jump and they take their hand and shove it up his gill plate right. and they grab his lip and then they lock their hands together. And now that glove is rasping on the gills, damaging their ability to breathe, killing those fish frequently. Their gills are super sensitive. And those studies they did with bonefish, they were telling me that when you take a bonefish out of the water for a picture, you know, the guy like holds it up. I, I'm trying to remember the exact, I mean, don't quote me on this, but it was something retarded. It was like, I think he said it was like 14 seconds after out of the water when they're breathing and their gills open and close, the membrane goes like drier and they start sticking together and they're like losing the ability to create oxygen because the gills touch each other and rip apart every time they, they open their mouth and flex their gill. Hmm. And it, it damages the membranes. Now, they're one of the most delicate ones. You know, bonefish are super delicate. But, you know, at like 20 seconds, when that gill's going dry and they're flexing their, their mouth breathing, they're ruining the, the membranes. And with guys with gloves, you watch all the tarp and stuff. And the glove goes in, you know, with a face grab, hashtag face grab. And I'm, I mean, I used to drag them in a boat. I used to do all that. I used to shove my hand up there to control the fish and get it to the customer. And then this guy has no idea what he's doing. He shakes right. it, drops him, bangs him on a deck, beats him to death. So that's why I'm trying to evolve and come up with the best solution possible for us to make a living and not kill these glorious animals is this giant, you know, lip gripping device, like a giant style boga mm -hmm. that you can clip onto his face but with the length of it, it's not just controlled by your wrist. It's two-handed so that when he shakes, he cannot hit his head on the boat. Mm. It's long enough that you can bump the boat ahead and keep his lips underwater and swim the fish, swim them in and out, revive them, open it, and push them away upright. They're, if you've, I'm sure you've seen their, 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 um, their ability to react to the, they call it the tonic state of immobility. Yeah. It's incredible. I mean, I've had fish eat the bait. A rod bends over and he jumps and he pulls the hook and lands upside down and just floats away mm -hmm. and sinks to the bottom. I've taken my anchor as it was deeper water and I'm looking, I'm drop the anchor and hit him on the bottom sitting there and he'll spin it and take off. So often with the rod tip of, of a fly rod, 
you know, you're in eight feet Anything, of water yeah. or whatever. A push pull. And you, you let him go, and, and he sinks right to the bottom, and you touch him with the fly rod, and gone. So what I learned with the scientist is that, like, you know, sometimes when I would catch him, I'd flip him over and get him to go to sleep, and then I'd take the hook out, and I'd control the fish and do what I'd do, and then I'd turn him upright after, you know, after I got the hook out, and then I'd release him. Mm-hmm. But they seem to be... They're they're so like the gladiators at heart. You know, some fish like sailfish. I don't have a lot of respect for them. <laughs> they got no heart. They eat. They jump around. They flop, 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 flop. Turn brown. Boom! You back up. Boom! Pop them off. Get a picture. Like rarely do you have like an epic battle. Like a jack, he doesn't give up. An amberjack, right. a permit, a tuna. When that tarpon's on. He's fighting for his life, you know, and if he's got some depth of water to him or a little cooler water like Miami, he's going to hurt you. You're going to remember that fish, that client. Mm -hmm. Now in the Keys, when the water temperatures get warmer, they burn out quicker. You know, we have more advantages, but in this fishery and this cold water, they're silver tunas. They're brutal. I have fish with three hour battles sometimes Hmm. on huge fish. And I mean, world-class anglers pulling as hard as they can. And you're like, this is stupid. <laughs> but in cold water, they're not overheating. And if he gets deep, if he gets in 50 foot of water, I've let him go past the cruise ships out there in the shipping lines. They just swim offshore and they just keep going. And you're like flying fish or jumping around. You're like, is this ever going to end? <laughs> you're marking him 300, 200 feet down. He's just swimming and comes up jumping out there and he's just cooled off. And But it, it, it's just a different dynamic. If you, by the time you get them to the boat where they're beaten, right, to where you can put your hands on them, you have a responsibility, in my opinion, to be as delicate as possible because he's at like the edge of death. Mm. And once you've gotten them that far, it's your responsibility, in my opinion, to bring them back. And, you know, I drag them by generally doesn't sound good i don't take the hooks out of my fish in the old days i never took a hook out hmm. i use barbless circle hooks and i get the leader on the fish and i have the guy lean over hold the leader i troll the motor ahead don't let him touch him so he doesn't freak out and jump and i just drag him with a trolling motor and get the fish paddling after they got a few shots i'd let him sink down you know four or five feet take a wrap and just glide along and let him just start thumping and he'd start getting stronger and stronger and stronger and stronger and I'd choke up on him, and I'd keep him pulling straight, and I'd pop him off. And he paddles away with a barbless circle hook. And I didn't touch him. I didn't. You see what happens. The guys catch the fish, right? Then they beat him down and try to get the hook out of the fish. Then they hold him for the picture, right? And then they try to let him go. He's at the tipping point like you look and he's mm-hmm. tail down his lips up just stone cold steve austin stop breathing and you got to turn him up right and you push him he's falling on his side and that's your dad that's a 30 40 50 60 year old fish mm-hmm. 80 year old fish if he's huge so i try to educate the clients and explain it to them and a lot of the times you know depending on the area how sharky it is Or depending on how hot the water is, I'll either say, this is your fight time. If you can't catch him in that time, we're breaking him off. You put the pressure on him, make him work harder. Not going to let him just, you know, wimpy lean on him. Mm -hmm. You put the coals to that fish. And, you know, the first tarpon ever, okay, you know, you try to be a little gentle with the guy and he wants his picture. But I tell him after that, that's it. You know, we get the leader and a fish comes up jumping. I take a wrap. I mean, you don't see a sailfish guy catching everyone to the bill. Mm -hmm. You get that leader, get a wrap on him, pull on him, put him in the air, jump him, jump him, break him off. Let him go right there while he's still in good shape. So one of the reasons I can catch more fish is I don't try to beat everyone to death. Right. Now, of course, you know, a lot of clients, first tarpon, okay, their first one of the night, whatever, if they get a really big one. But other than that, I try to burn through them and not spend so much time catching every single fish to beat it to death. And, you know, you can get doubles, get the leader on this one, boom, hand right, grab that leader, fish comes up, jumps, break them off, one's on over here, start pitching out two more baits. Yeah, it seems it seems really easier for someone who's catching 800 
in a year catching and then jumping probably thousands more um, to, to be like, yeah, don't worry about that one because there's going to be another one. But there's lots of places where catching one is rare. I mean, like some of these fisheries that are being pioneered in other places, North Carolina, South Carolina, where they don't catch a lot. So catching one is a really big deal. Um, and they want that picture really bad. And so many people want that picture really, really bad of, um, you know, their trip to the keys or whatever. My personal opinion is that the video or the picture of the thing jumping by the boat is aesthetically more pleasing to me than a semi dead popsicle tarpon on the surface right there. Um, and so I think a lot of guides and what I was doing was, was I had a camera slung around my slung around, you know, I'd pole and the cameras over here and you pick it up and, you know, you know, when they're going to jump, they're going to jump right now. You can see it happening. It's really slow. Yeah. And if you can do that, I think, you know, no, better than the guides aren't going to have a professional photographer on the boat. That's ridiculous. But you know, you, you have a phone in your pocket. And run the video, yeah. pause it, and freeze frame it. How many guys are getting great shots? They're sitting with their phone, fish jumps. Yeah. He's videoing it. He goes back, slow motion, pause. There's the shot, yeah. freeze frame. Here's your picture. Yeah. And not to mention that it probably gets you 20 different, 20 more trips on when you post that on social media. Um, I'm with you. I think that there is a responsibility. Um, you, you certainly have a responsibility to the fish. Uh, Tarpon is one of my three favorite fish for sure. And, you know, I'm, I'm exactly, uh, on the same page as that. The more I learn about them, the more incredible of a fish they are. And I don't think we really even know that much about them in the time that I've been fishing for them. We've learned a tremendous amount more about their, I mean, there was some, you know, thought that every tarpon you see swam from Africa. Like in the old Billy Pate videos and stuff like that. It's like, this is what they do. And it's like, but it was 60 degrees and then it got to be 85. And now there's 50 of them sitting in overnight. They're that was just a quick all trip from Africa, here. wasn't yeah. it? <laughs> like they, they really are a super fish. <laughs> but, you know, there has to be some, you know, local fish and then some some truly migratory fish. Um, but I, I look, I, I hope that... Um, You know, people like yourself that are catching so many and are doing so much uh, continue to work with the scientists and continue to to do that so that we can learn more about these fish and 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 protect them. It's amazing the things that I learned from these scientists. I mean, blows my mind the stuff that they're I'm like, really? And it makes you, you know, you want to be a good hunter. You got to know your prey, you know, exactly. And like tricks i've learned i mean i i never realized how good their eyesight was you know it, when hearing. you tell me that it, i find it amazing that we can ever get one to bite right exactly i'm like how did i ever catch these stupid things if they're this you know this good eyesight but you know they gotta eat right and the people are like oh man there must be a million shrimp running your crush them last time I'm like well there was no shrimp running but my shrimps were in the water with hooks in them and they were hungry and they ate them it wasn't competing with thousands of other shrimps. Right. So the fishing was actually pretty good because there wasn't much other food around but mine, you know. But it's like things I've done to like that I never realized, like stupid things. Like I learned a trick. I don't leave my boat in neutral. Hmm. Why is that? What happens when your boat's in neutral? I don't know. You don't go anywhere. You just sit there. Your engine's running. I'm saying like if you're if you're drifting, if you're trolling, or if you're anchored and your boat's in neutral. Your props turning on the current. Oh, right. Generally, we all have stainless props. These big, beautiful, shiny, four-blade, three-blade yeah. stainless props. And I was like, man, I can't get these fish to get near me. They're just freaking out. I'm being so quiet. And I'm like, I got to look like a freaking helicopter over the right. head, right? <laughs> so I put the boat in gear. I start fishing a boat in gear all the time with the engine off, but in gear. And all of a sudden, my fish are coming so much closer because that prop isn't sitting there spinning. Right. And I was like. That'll you got be beautiful, clear water. You got Miami sunshine. I can see them. Florida Keys sunshine. They can see me. He can see that good. He see, looks up. Instead of being a shadow or a boat, like, I got this thing spinning, right? So if I don't have my engine on, it's like I put the motor in gear. 
you can if you dive right you can hear the clicking of the lower oh, unit yeah. you can hear the transducers clicking absolutely you hear the transducers making all these noises you know sometimes i turn off my electronics sometimes i turn off my my put my boat in, in neutral and put it in gear i turn my libel pumps off i put my yeah. bubblers on on rubber mounted pads hmm. and you know you don't the same thing that you see in the daytime it's like you're pulling and you can see a string coming at you and then you bend them and they go around you. Mm -hmm. Those same things happen at night, exact same way, except you don't see them because it's dark out, right? But you start learning things like, well, if I'm going to drift this bay or if I'm going to troll a motor to this spot, if I'm going to sit here and my hull's going to be in the wind and I'm going to be making a chine slap, right? And then you can, you can see floating fish spook away at a distance. Mm -hmm. But then when you learn, all right, well, if I come in, with the wind at my stern across this spot and I drifted or trolling motor and I can, you know, counter myself with the, by turning the motor or trolling motoring it. And then you spook a fish and you see a boil and it's three feet from the boat. You know that you snuck up on him that close. Right. Right. You know, and then you can turn your live wells on. If you have old, like I used to have the old sure flow pumps mm -hmm. and it was like a blender. Right. Terrible. They use the rules. They burn out all the time. They don't last for anything. They always burn out, burn out, burn out. And then you go to the sure flows that don't burn out. But I mean, people are like, is your bilge pump running dry? What is that noise? You can hear from the duck. Right. <laughs> and that's the sure flow. They suck, but they don't burn out as fast as the rules do. And then I switch those hooker electric pumps. And they have a rheostat switch. Right? Mm -hmm. So I can turn my volume down real low instead of going, oh. Because it's it's very gentle, so I can turn my my sound down, and I swear to God, like I, I like you see it, like you have to understand, it's like throwing grenades. You know, when you hook a big fish and he jumps and lands and you push to school, you know, it's like playing Frogger, and you're all the time trying to play and hide and go seek these little bastards, and you slip in and you hook them. And then, you know, somebody comes up with their spreader lights on next to you and puts out the baits. You're like, here comes a UFO. Right. That's a UFO to these guys. Like, you know, alien abduction. Boat comes in, <laughs> spreader lights are on, million candle power spotlights are going on. And it's like, okie dokie, I turn my running lights off. and I have an extra set of running lights up high that put no ambient light in the water. Mm. So they boats can see me, but I'm not using my led four mile super bright lights that i can see the bottom at night with right well if i can see that don't you think they can if they can see five thousand times better than me yeah they absolutely can you know so it's like you start sitting there and you're like analyzing everything and you're going crazy like driving yourself nuts will be like what can i do to get the next bite you know let me shut yeah. my lights off shut my pumps off put the boat in gear so the prop isn't turning at night i can see my shadow on the bottom at night right well, this water's crystal clear. I'm going to go down to 30 pound liter and I'm going to fish side planters and get that bait 70 feet out. Cause when I come in and I push them and I bend that school, like I would in the daytime, I'm going to bend them out into my baits. Cause if it's right here, he's just going to push away. Interesting. You know, it's all these little things you start like putting together in your head. And the same thing you see in the day happen at night. You just don't know it. Mm -hmm. But when you start like getting nutty about it, all of a sudden you're catching a lot of fish. Yeah. And you just start changing like one, two, three, four, five, ten, twenty different little crazy things. You well, know? each one of those things. I remember one time uh, I was talking to Tim Hoover when I was a very young guide, and Tim Hoover was winning all the tournaments, and he was nice enough to talk to me about it. And he was like, "Well, I just pay attention to the details. I just, you know, make sure the hooks are sharp, and you know." He just started naming a couple of things, and he's like, "And then." You know, I get a 1% advantage on all these different things. Yeah. But if I do 50 of them, <laughs> I got a 50% advantage. Ahead of the game, yeah. And you know what? I don't know if his math was right or whatever, but it, it made sense. And I started thinking, okay, well, that's what it's all about. It's all about these details. And if, like, for example, you know, I come up here to talk to you about catching 800 tarpon, like, how in the world are you doing this? But when you start talking like that, like, you're paying attention to every little detail, and you're taking a 1% advantage anywhere you can get it, and you're continually doing this in a fishery that uh, you can fish, um, 
during the time when there aren't tarp in other places, and then you're moving to another place where they're tarp. It makes total sense. It's a, it's, I, it's for sure. I see exactly how it's happening. It's, it's funny because like, like I see people live in boxes, and if you just do what somebody else showed you, you're never going to be different. You're never going to change the game. You're never going to get ahead. You know. And I'm nuts. Like, I don't make any money. I stay up all night. I go crazy. I'm changing lights, changing pumps. I'm doing this. I'm doing that. I'm putting rubber under my bubblers. I'm doing this. And I mean, you know, if you dive, like, and you hear a Jewfish, right? When he spooks, and he goes, thump, 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 yeah. when he runs away, right? You're like, wow, man, I can really hear loud stuff down here. And, you know, you could open a hatch on like a Kevlar boat and hear the barnacles popping on the pilings around you when it's really quiet out. And you're like, listen to how the sound resonates, you know? And, and then you're thinking, I'm trying to hunt the sneakiest bastard on the planet. I need to change the game. And like, you know, I only use a red headlight at night. Mm-hmm. I don't put any white light in the water. You know, at the end of the game, you know, like I try to like manage my herd, you know, like sometimes I'll hook fish and I'll drift away or drive away in a fish jump. But I know that like the herd pushed a little bit, you know. And you have to mat- and mentally like, you know, draw pictures in your head of what's going on. And so and the client's like, oh, no lights. So just be quiet. Just let's let's just get out of here. And I'll go scope out, you know, say 200 yards of line and then get over there. And then, okay, now they, they, you know, crank up the drags. They fight the fish to me. And now we get our lights and our pictures way over here. And then we do this giant U-turn and then shut down and, you know, either running or idling or whatever the spot, how big it is. And, you know, and like you fish a bridge and you see these morons that hook a fish and run straight up their own, you know, line and go right back to the piling and tie up. Mm. And then you see the charter guys that hook the fish and they run down current, go down the bridge and then go around to a giant U-turn and they come in from the top and then they slip in and turn and then tie back up again while their spot's cooling off instead of plowing right back up over their spot. Mm -hmm. You know, which is all these little tiny things that, you know, you change the game with by, respecting the fish and knowing that like everything you do makes them react every light you turn on especially the shallower the water it gets you know if you're in 50 foot of water you know you can slip a little you know you can do certain things to be like stupid and hey you're still going to catch a couple fish but the shallower it gets and the clearer it gets the more of a ninja you got to be and, and I mean, you get so stupid with it sometimes that I, like, you're like, well, this headlight has like a half dead battery. So I'm using these till I, you know, till I get away from the fish. And then I have a second headlight on my head with a, with a fresh battery that I'll shine and take pictures with and then come back in and just be like, you know, and clients are just like, they're like, okay. And then they see it all work. And then, then they laugh when they leave. They're like, I know, I know, no lights, no lights. Okay, I know, I know, no, you know, cooler lids. Okay, know this. Okay, know that. I mean, the same fly mentality the guy is in the daytime. Don't drop your hatch. Don't do this. Don't mm-hmm. do that. It's the same fish. You just don't see them spooking around you. And if you bring that same craziness to the game like the fly guys bring, except you just put lots of hooks in the water. <laughs> and perfect baits. <laughs> you know, the bait has a lot to do with it. I. I mean, I buy my crabs in the Keys, say 500 at a clip. Mm-hmm. Not many guys buy 500 crabs in a clip. It's expensive. Yeah. You know, shrimps are cheap. They're easy. Shrimps, stupid shrimps. I love shrimp. They're so nice. Mm-hmm. Mullet are expensive. If you have to buy them, the crabs are crazy expensive. Three, four, five, six bucks a piece. Mm-hmm. And you look at the guy's live well, like, I always tell people, I said, you know, if you go to battle, you better be prepared for war, right? When you look in a guy's boat and there's two rods and four baits in the well, like, what is he expecting? Right. If there's 16 rods in a boat and on a four hour, I bring 25 crabs minimum. If I have less than that, I'm freaking out. Like mm-hmm. that, if I, if I see 25, I'm like, man, we're really low. Like I need to get another load here. I've generally got a hundred or two in the boat just in case, but I'm keeping them with fresh water and changing them and, you know, and most guys don't have a hundred and change crabs in the boat every single day that they leave the dock. Yeah. Not many at all. I generally have 
a hundred to five hundred in my boat, my wells running, and you know, keep them alive. You can always justify things like that, like you know, you come down to a six dollar crab, and you're like, okay, I've got a hundred twenty thousand dollar boat, I've got you know thirty thousand dollars worth of tackle, I've yeah. put I put five hundred dollars worth of gas in the boat today, I have. You know, I have but a, a, a seventy thousand dollars truck to pull all this with, <laughs> and this person is paying a thousand dollars. So, am I going to run out of bait? No, not running out of bait. But you know that there, there's other things that have to happen, though. You you have enough experience to where you know that you can buy five hundred crabs at a time, and you're going to keep them alive, and they're not all going to die overnight. You got to feed them, right? You got to do all kinds of stuff, and that yeah. all comes with a tremendous amount of experience and a tremendous amount of failure. Oh, like I've so killed expensive. so many shrimp, it's like I'm a shrimp murderer. You know, trying to trying to figure out how to they keep kill them alive. each other. Yeah, and then you know I've killed tons of crabs by keeping them with shrimp and. And I don't know what it is about shrimp, but when they die, they kill crabs like it's poison. I mean, it's just bad news. So I just it don't does. keep them, don't keep them together anymore. But I mean, you know, you have to be a, a, a certain experience level to to have enough confidence to buy five hundred crabs. Yeah, I mean, it, it ain't it, cheap. No, it's not cheap, and it's going to be a hard <laughs> lesson when you wake up in the morning. And every single one of those is oh, dead. Yeah. I mean, um, you can take. I tell you this: you can take a ten pound bonita, ten, twelve, fifteen pounder knock the sides off them and drop them in a bait pen with like 500 crabs in it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so there's like a carcass with, you know, a lot of meat on both sides of it. Mm -hmm. And then the two fillets and you go out there in a couple of days. Gone. You know what's left? The, the oodleless. <laughs> Nothing. <laughs> they, they Sometimes a cheek plate. Right. Sometimes yeah. a cheek plate. I know they go after the backbones. It. Everything is gone. Like, it's like Jesus thinks these eat a human if you fell in there and died. Like I guarantee you, you could get rid of a body. Unbelievable! These crabs are, and they got no claws. I know, no claws. The thing's mean as hell. Yeah, he's in the well killing the other crabs. You know what? You know what kills them real good though? Pinfish. Try keeping five pinfish in there with those crabs, and they'll eat the, the legs off of fish, all of them. The trigger fish, the file fish, get to a pen if it's not double walled. If right. it's in water. And they start ripping all the legs off me. Look down and there's three file fish just ripping away. Yeah. Like that just cost me 300 bucks. Yeah. <laughs> Holy crap. I like the Get double. My spear gun. I'm I like kill the these double two. walled. Uh, you got a double walled pins. The double walled pins. That's, a, that's an excellent When idea. all their little legs hang out, everything gets ripped apart. You've got a double wall of pens with shrimps and crabs. Mm -hmm. Triggers, files, pair, like all that kind of stuff. That's the worst enemy. You get octopus in there? I never have. I have. I had a, in my canal, would get an octopus in there, and octopus wins. Oh, to, the to octopus mad wins everything. Everything. You're not stopping <laughs> I mean, him. I mean, he is, he, if, if it, it gets in there, it will be the only thing, and you leave it in the water long enough, it will be the only thing left in there, guaranteed, 100%. That's the smartest thing, like, stupid. I've seen the scientists and stuff at work, like, studies, and incredibly smart animal smart animal and also super um super incredible in the way that they can fit anywhere Tiny and there's spaces. this there's this there's this video that my son my son showed me on on uh, instagram or youtube and it's this giant octopus i mean this thing is giant and it's on a big boat that has scuppers on the side and it starts to stick its legs out there and the mate you can hear the mate talking to the tourists that are on the boat and one of them's like, are you going to help him get out? And he goes, oh, no, he'll get out right there. And there's this little hole about like this on the scupper on the side of the boat. And he goes, if he can fit his beak through there, then he can fit anywhere that his beak will fit through because he can compress his body to anything else. And, uh, you know, there's other videos of, of pretty large octopus getting in beer bottles underwater and then coming out and changing colors and doing all this. But this this one of this this giant octopus fitting through a hole like this it's pretty incredible. I mean, they, those, those, that's an incredible animal. That's another animal that, um, if you, if you really, truly started learning about that, it the, would blow yeah, your mind. They're, they're just retarded smart. My yeah. buddy worked at a lab in the Bahamas and they'd put food in a mason jar and screw it on in right. front of him, hand it to him. He grabs it, unscrews the lid, pulls the food out. They had the latch on it. He'd reach up, open the latch, grab the mason jar, boom. They had to keep locks on the cage. I mean, just super tight seals. Those things are, crazy i put one i've caught him and put him in like in the live well on a sport fish or something 
And they come like, hey, guys, check out the thing I caught last night. You know, when I'm anchor watching. Like, Gone. Where the hell did he go? Gone. He went. He probably went through the the the. I don't know. Pipe, the drain gone. pipe. Wherever he went, they're gone Any, every time. They can go anywhere that they can fit their beak. They're, they're, I mean, they're, they're the similar super smart animal. And that's like, if you take those mentalities and put them towards tarpon, you know, and it's funny because it may sound cocky to say or conceited. Like, I don't think there's anybody in the United States that releases as many fish as I do because they don't put in the effort. They're not as crazy. They don't fish eight months a year for tarpon. They don't put in as long a time. Their houses, different locations should chase these stupid things. And, you know, it's funny because like there, there becomes like two groups, the people that know me and then are my friends and we work together and trade trips and, you know, we help each other out. And then there's like the haters out there. Like there's impossible. No, you could do that. That guy lies. And then the other one's like, send you customers at this time of year when they, they have clients that want to catch tarpon in January and February. And you're like, I got you. No problem. You know? Right. And then if I got a customer, I send it to them at a the time of year, like in Boca Grande, their spots good or whatever. And you work together, but it's funny. Like you contacted me and you have a charter business and it's like, you know, you can converse with people. And then there's the other side of the coin that, that just, if they can't do it, they don't believe it. Well, you always, that's exactly what I was just about to say that if, if somebody, has only caught five tarpon ever their best day ever then it's impossible that you could be doing that but what they're not hearing and what this podcast will help them to understand is that you're a mad scientist dude that's what you are you're a mad scientist and you know there there are some crazy fly guys out there there's some crazy offshore guys out there there's craziness and when i say craziness i'm talking about complete obsessive ocd behavior where you are going to try to get every advantage that you can possibly get and if there is anything that you can do to even if it's in your own confidence to to help you to catch one more fish yeah. You're going to do it. Bass fishermen, the tournament bass fishermen are that way. It, they they be. want every single advantage. They're turning off their electronics. They're doing everything. They're using push poles. Some of those guys are using push poles. And they're, those guys are smart. And not only are they smart, but they're fishing for millions of dollars. Yeah, the little so green fish pay all the money. Right. Well, I mean, but it's the same thing. It's not about the money. It's about, you know, it's about trying to figure out what what you can do better. And the basis of all of that is respect for the fish. And just like you're talking about, if you want to be a good hunter, you need to know a lot about your prey. And if you want to be a good fisherman, you need to know a lot about those fish, but you also need to know a lot about the way that your behavior affects those fish. And that's within your control. That's what I like. I, because your footprint. There I are plenty it. of things that you can't control about the tarpon. You can't control the weather. You can't control what another boat does. You can't control a lot of these things. But the things that are within your control are, you know, are your bait pumps loud? Do you, do you slam the hatches? Uh, you know, how do you enter the spot? How do you exit the spot? Are you, you know, all of these kind of things are within your control. And those are the type of things that really make an exponential difference and, and go between catching 200 tarpon a year and catching 800 tarpon a year. I'll make you laugh. Maybe today <laughs> on the way back, I stopped at this one tackle shop in the West Coast because I can buy split shots in bulk. And they have this like eagle claw, it's this big bag. Like you go to tackle shops mm -hmm. anywhere in the Keys, and they're you know, a little bag 25 of, a piece, yeah. And it's like five, six bucks, right? I'm buying this big, huge bulk bag for like 10 bucks, but they're shiny, they're mm -hmm. fresh lets. And I bought like 400 split shots today. And I take them and I put them in a bag, a bucket of salt water, and then I lay them out in the sun. So they get that gray mm -hmm. dullness to them. Yeah. Because I don't like shiny leads. <laughs> when I look at them, they're real shiny. I'm like, I don't want to use those leads. I leave my leads out to get gray. Like when I used to bluefin tuna fish, the guys, we would, they taped their leads up. We'd magic marker all our swivels and our crimps. Uh-huh. So there was no like light reflecting off it. And then you think, well, this is the smartest little bastard in the world for the eye vision. You know, if I did all that to catch these tunas, you know, so I don't use shiny weights ever. I would buy all my lead in advance. and I. What, what kind of hook do you use? 
my normal like go to hook is a seven O V M C circle hook, the normal wire one. Is that a red hook? It's black. Black. They make a red hook though. VMC, right? Yeah, I think they do. What so do you you're are you concerned with uh shiny hooks? No, because the hook is a normal black hook and it's not it's if it's if it if it's you know anything that what it is it's rusting you know what i mean mm-hmm. so it's not like i don't use like a like the sl12 hooks like they have the new black ones and they used to the regular silver ones and i did okay with the silver ones too but i would paint my silver hooks i'd magic marker them or i'd or i'd paint them or i'd i tried um having stuff plated mm. so i wouldn't damage like the chemical sharpness my buddy is in the air <laughs> in the aircraft industry and they 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 chemically like night cadmium and they plate these different things and i'd give them hooks and i haven't played them for me because hmm. when i was doing different things like tuna fish and i wanted the sharpest hook but i didn't want to you know sh- if you sharpen it then you take that chemical right. coating right. off yeah and something happens when you troll like one of the best blue on hooks i use for light tackles the sp600 a Tiemco fly hook mm-hmm. it's incredible i quit making the ado but if you use the gamagatsus and stuff the live bait hooks they're great hooks, but if you rig them on a 900 pound cable with a crimp, something happens with that that black carbon hook in the cable at electrolysis, and the tips fall off after like four hours of trolling. What? Try it. Wow. Troll them four or five hours. You bring them in, the tips are rusted off, missing. And I was in you know, all these different things, and I try, and I my buddies at the his dad has a you know airplane parts company, and they have plating machines, and I've had everything sandblasted, and I cadmium plated, you know, plated with this, plated with that, and and I'd go trolling and try different hooks and tuna fish and I'd plate different hooks and try different things and, you know, trying to have the sharpest hook possible. You know, if you're trolling it, the electrolysis builds up on them with the stainless crimp and I rig them on mono instead uh-huh. and just try different things. But it, uh, you know, when you're tarpon fishing, I, I think that a dark hook is good. You know, it may not reflect the light as well, but, um, it's, uh, like you say, it's all the stupid, crazy things you do. Like I leave my lead out in the sun and turn them gray and dusty. You know, they're like, they, mm-hmm. you know, they get your fingers dirty. They're not the shiny mm-hmm. new, brand new leads out mm-hmm. of the out of the bag. Yeah. Well, it obviously works, and you are a <laughs> you are a wild, mad scientist, and and the the things that I've heard about you are true. I can I can tell you that um, I, I want to. You're you're the kind of guy that I'd like to go fishing with. Uh, I have the same mad scientist bone in my body and uh, we will get together and do it. Um, so tell us, we've been going for an hour and 48 minutes. Can you believe that? Wow. Um, once you start telling stories, it goes pretty fast. Tell them how they can get in touch with you and where they can find you. My phone number is 786-290-FISH-3474. Uh, Instagram, Fish Russ, one word follow my stories on there all season long and by the page or Russell Kleppinger on Facebook. Awesome. Those awesome. are the best ways to reach me. All right. Well, if you want to go and catch a tarpon, this is the man. He's caught a lot of them and, uh, and obviously knows a lot about them. So anyway, until next week, we'll see you. All right. Russ, great conversation, man. I appreciate it. Appreciate you coming. Appreciate all you guys listening. I hope you learned something about tarpon, something about guiding, something about a work ethic. If you feel like it, run over there to iTunes, rate and review the show. Love to see some ratings pop up there, some reviews. Apparently, that makes a huge difference in being able to get this show to more people, having it be more popular, building that audience. And really appreciate the people who have rated and reviewed the show so far. Uh, if you haven't, Please take a second, run over there and do that. That'd be super awesome. And if you want to, you can hit me with an email, podcast at saltwaterexperience.com. Let me know who else you want to see on the podcast, and I'll do my best to get them on. All right, I'll see you next week. 